we should get started. Um, Jessica and I have both been Scrum Masters before, so in the interest of keeping that time box, um, we'll just go ahead and as people join, uh, that's fine. So a lot of you have joined us in the last couple of webinars, so thank you so much if you've joined us previously. If not, welcome to the first um, for you Agile and EV integration webinar series. Jessica and I will take just a couple minutes to introduce ourselves to you if you haven't met us before. Um, I'm Denise Jarvie, and I have a very long background in specifically the Department of Defense. Um, I used to be in the Army. I um, worked at Northrop Grumman for quite some time, and then I started doing um, consulting work, specifically earned value management and traditional project management at the beginning. Um, and I've worked with lots of different organizations, both on the contractor side, as well as the customer side. Um, I worked doing that type of work for many years. And, um, you know, during that time, I learned a little bit about Agile. I was kind of on the outside of some of the Scrum teams, uh, but not really immersed in it until I decided to take a break from all of that consulting and travel. And I started working at a local company as a project manager, actually a program manager. And um, on my second day at that local company, um, I was nicely informed that we would be doing an Agile transformation. Um, and so the next couple of years, I learned how to be a scrum master, how to work on a team, um, and really grew my knowledge about Agile and Scrum until I became an Agile coach. Um, and then I came back to the Department of Defense and realized that there's a huge need for um, learning and training and coaching of Agile and specifically how to be Agile um, and still maintain compliance. So I won't bore you with more details than that, especially since is, this is the third time we've um, done the webinar. But I'm very excited to share more of my experiences about Agile and Agile and EV um, with you today. All right, Jess. All right, thank you, Denise. Um, so my name is Jessica Crowley, and since you're with us, probably this is your third time. I'm an enterprise agile coach and trainer, and I'm working very closely with Denise to um, build up radically better agile for Humphreys and Associates. Um, I've done a lot of work with for profit, non profit, and the government sector. And so I'm really excited to share with you guys everything that I've learned um, transforming organizations and living through an agile transformation from start until it successfully expanded. Um, so I've traveled the world and I've taught thousands of people in Scrum um, and, and in Agile. So I, I can't wait to share with you guys everything that I've learned. Awesome, thank you. All right, so um, as Jessica mentioned, if you were on the call a little early today, um, we started out with a huge list of topics. Um, and we've slowly been working off the topics based on your prioritization. Um, so Jessica and I took a look at the poll results and we've organized the remaining topics for you today. Um, so I'm gonna start with the introduction to Scrum. The first thing that we typically talk to clients about when I'm just introducing them to Scrum is empiricism and this concept of the three pillars. Uh, so if you've not heard of empiricism, it's basically uh, that knowledge comes from experience. Um, and you make decisions based on the information and the knowledge that you have today. So it's not that you aren't going to know more tomorrow or more next week. Um, you know, you will, but you make the best decisions that you possibly can with the knowledge and the experience that you have today. Um, and the three pillars which hold up Scrum and empiricism are transparency, inspection, and of course, adaptation. Um, so transparency is that the process really must be visible to those that are actually responsible um, for Scrum and for the product, for the output. So in Scrum, we make things very visible and that holds up this um, concept of empiricism because we're making sure that you have the most information or all of the information that's available to us today so that you can make the best decisions. The second pillar of Scrum is inspection. So inspection, uh, we do all the time. I, I like to say we frequently inspect and we inspect several different things. Um, we're inspecting the Scrum artifacts. Um, we're checking what is the output? What is the product? What is the artifact that we're developing? And we're looking to see if there's any deficiencies, if there's some type of variance so that we can correct, so that we can adapt and correct 
uh, and not have those deficiencies anymore. So we're constantly inspecting and I'll teach you some different times that we do that in the Scrum framework um, in just a few minutes. And then the last pillar that holds up Scrum and empiricism is adaptation. So in Scrum, we're always adapting. We're adapting so that we can make adjustments based on things like customer feedback, test results, um, more information that we're getting on a daily basis through all of the different Scrum events. Um, so this is empiricism and the three pillars of Scrum. So the next thing is why and what is Scrum? Well, as I mentioned, it's an empirical process. Um, we use small cross-functional teams, and we'll talk all about exactly what is the Scrum team composition here in just a few minutes. Um, and we'll also go into some details later in today's presentation about exactly what is cross-functional teams, because we get a lot of questions about that one. So we'll dive in a little bit deeper into how you can get started with uh, cross-functional teams. But in Scrum, it's a small cross-functional team of about three to nine people typically. And the goal for these teams is to produce or create, develop a potentially shippable product. Um, so at the end of a sprint, at the end of these iterations, the team is actually showing the customer and the stakeholders a potentially shippable product, something that's been developed and tested, and it could potentially actually go out to a customer. Um, Scrum has a feedback loop. So you saw that inspect and adapt were part of the Scrum pillars. And that's really important because we're trying to get as much feedback as possible so that we understand our customer, we understand what they value, and we understand if we're making a good product or not so that we can adapt if we need to, to ensure that we're providing that value to our customer. And also it's very iterative and incremental. So I'll talk to you about uh, Scrum and what is the process of um, using sprints, or iterations, and we'll talk about this iterative and incremental process for development. And um, I'll start to show you some of the benefits that organizations can get from using a Scrum framework based on this iterative and incremental approach. And by the way, if you have any questions, raise your hand. Um, please speak up if you'd like to as well. Jessica's monitoring the chat for me, and uh, we definitely value your questions. Uh, so the first thing that we're, oh, do you have a question, Jess? Go ahead. Oh, she's just saying hello. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the next um, thing. That can you please share this? Uh, can you please send the slides by email? I'm having trouble in joining the training. Sure. Okay. So Jessica, if you don't mind sending the PDF now, Andy's, that'd be great. Um, we usually send them after, but no problem. We will adapt. <laughs> Thank so you. Still, yes, of course. You're very welcome. Um, so the next thing that I want to talk about is I'm actually going to go through the Scrum roles. And you can see that I have three circles on here. It's like a little Venn diagram. And what we have is the product owner, the Scrum master, and the development team. So what's really interesting in Scrum is that that's it. Those are the three roles. Um, there's not a lot of other uh, roles or titles in Scrum. So I'm going to walk you through the role, the responsibilities um, of these three, three roles in Scrum. So the first one I'm going to talk to you about is the product owner. This is a really important role in Scrum. The product owner is responsible for what we call the product backlog. So if you're not familiar with the product backlog, um, I'll describe it a little bit here for you today. Um, it's an ordered list of all of the work that the team has to complete in order to develop a product. Um, so the product owner is responsible for maintaining this ordered list of work that the team has to complete. I'm showing um, just a little snapshot of something out of one of the um, Agile tools. This is basically a release plan or a snapshot of um, what is the team supposed to work on and when will it be uh, ready for the customer. So the product owner keeps this ordered list and they prioritize all of the work. And they are aware of the customer need by dates and they're keeping track of that um, in a very transparent and a very clear way so that everybody on the team as well as um, you know internal stakeholders the customer the team members are very aware of what is in the backlog they're making sure that it's not only prioritized and visible but that it's the right work 
So the product owner um, has the product vision in mind and they have the team vision in mind. So when they're writing these stories or developing the work that they're putting in the product backlog, they're always keeping that in mind so that the team is working on the, the right thing, the most valuable thing to the customer. Um, and actually the product owner is supposed to optimize the value of the work that the team performs. Um, so the product owner maintains the backlog, they clearly express the work. So uh, if you attended some of our other trainings, we've talked to you about the use of things like acceptance criteria and definition of done. Um, and that's something that the product owner would be maintaining so that everybody understands the what uh, very clearly. And they make the, the backlog visible and you notice I have, um, you know, the customer on there in bright orange. And the reason I have the customer on there is because the product owner is supposed to be working with that customer. So the product owner understands the customer and should be spending up to maybe 50% of their time with the customer gathering, you know, the information and talking to them about what is coming up, um, what should be in the backlog. And then they're relaying that information to the team. So they also need to be, the product owner also needs to be available to the team. And that can get tricky, especially in organizations who are just starting out. Um, sometimes we see, um, especially in Department of Defense, we see product owners who are also CAMs, they're also control account managers, or they have other responsibilities within the organization, and they can get very busy. So we like to say that 50% of the time with the team, 50% of the time with the customer. Um, but I realize uh, that that can be challenging, especially at the beginning. Beginning. So the product owner is always looking at the target. They're always looking at that vision and they're communicating that to the team. So they're understanding the customer and making sure the backlog is updated and that everybody understands the direction that the team is supposed to go in. So the next role is the scrum master. The scrum master is really a servant leader. So the scrum master serves the product owner the, the Scrum Master also serves the team, so the development team members, as well as their organization. Uh, so the Scrum Master can act as a coach. A lot of times when I was a Scrum Master, I felt like I was a coach. I was coaching the product owner to do the right things and make sure that he or she was, you know, writing down the uh, acceptance criteria and pri prioritizing the backlog. I was coaching the team members to um, make sure that they're following the best practices of Agile. I was working with the organization to um, increase, you know, the knowledge of Scrum. Um, I also, as a Scrum Master, would facilitate events. So um, we'll go through the events here in a couple of minutes. And sometimes uh, that would be the, well, it is the Scrum Master's job to ensure that the events are happening, that they're happening appropriately. Another really big thing that the Scrum Masters do is impediment removal. So as the teams are executing work, they're coming up with impediments or blockers, or they might come up with impediments, uh, you know, and that's something that the Scrum Master will help, you know, as a facilitator, impediment removal person. So I'm going to work with some of the other Scrum Masters, or I might raise an impediment if it's something that the team can't handle. Um, and I also say that the Scrum Master really has to be a people person because they're working with you know, a lot of different other people within the organization and they have to be able to um, communicate really well and a lot of times do like conflict resolution to try to pull the team together and make the team very cohesive um, so that the team can produce and the team can be more productive. Um, so the Scrum Master really is an important role and it has, uh, they have a lot of different responsibilities um, and I would say that a lot of times the scrum masters actually influence and cause change that enable the team to get better and get faster. Um, so if you have any questions about these topics, please let me know and um, we'll go to the next one, which is the development team members. So the development team is probably the most important role because they're the ones doing the work. They're actually developing, they're creating the product. Um, they are self-organizing. In other words, they get to decide the how. Um, they may not get to choose exactly what team they're on, but once they have formed a team, they get to self-organize in what are the norms, what are the values on our team, and how are we going to execute this work? How are we gonna be a team? Um, so I, I really like that aspect of Scrum, actually. 
also the development team is cross-functional. So you see on here, we have the team vision at the center, um, really at the core of the team is what is the vision? What products are we going to produce? And which different types of people or skill sets do we need on the team? Um, so the team members might have one core um, skill that they're really good in. They're very deep in, for example, software engineering, um, but they also have a broad skills. They're becoming more cross with other teams and um, all of the skills that are needed are on the team. So it's a cross-functional self-organizing team. They have all of the skills necessary to um, complete the products and the team vision that they have. And also there are no titles. So all of these people, even though you see there might be a system engineer level five and a mechanical engineer level two, um, in Scrum, we really just say development team member. So we don't use um, titles. And also there are no sub teams. So this is another one where I see all the time at organizations, um, and a lot of times it's because they're maybe not as mature of an agile organization, their new team. What they start to do is create sub teams within their scrum team. For example, test. They'll say, well, we're, you know, we're the test part of the scrum team, or we're the development part of the scrum team. And that is definitely not advisable. Um, so no sub team. And you notice I've got the, the T here. So I started to explain that each of the um, development team members on the Scrum team have a particular functional area. Like, of course, they went to school for a certain particular discipline and they have a specialty and probably years of experience in one particular functional area or discipline. But they start to work outside of that area as well. And some of the techniques uh, that Scrum team when they're working together allows that knowledge saturation or knowledge spread across the organization. So that's something that I have found to be very useful and very good on Scrum teams. And then if you notice on the lower left-hand part of my slide, I have um, you know, these three people working on what's called a Kanban board. So this is a tool that development teams on you know, Scrum teams use all the time. Um, if you read any of the you know, latest information out there about what, are, what techniques and tools are people using in Scrum, most of them are using Kanban. So it's a way of showing their workflow. Um, Jessica's gonna talk to you more actually about Kanban here in a little bit, but even in Scrum, it's very helpful to use either a physical board or an agile tool so that everybody on the team understands what is in the backlog um, and what are they working on now, what's next and what's been uh, completed. And the last thing I have on this slide is, is we. It says one for all and all for one and unite. Um, I put that on here because it really is a team. It's, your, it's actually a, almost a culture shift from me as an individual into that team mentality, which is really important for the development team to understand um, you know, when they're doing Scrum. All right. So the Scrum event. There are five different events that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, the sprint, sprint planning, the daily stand-up, the sprint review, and the sprint retrospective. So the first one is the sprint. Sometimes this is called iteration. If you're familiar with the different types of Scrum frameworks, then you might use different language or different words that really mean the same thing. Um, so the sprint is just a time box and it means uh, it should be a time box of one to four weeks. So something less than one month. I will say that um, I think that Jessica and I would agree that as we've worked with a lot of different organizations across different industries and we've started up scrum teams and we've followed them through, uh, you know, their product life cycle. And uh, we found that four weeks is pretty long. We recommend really about two weeks for most teams. Um, the Scrum Guide, if you haven't seen it before, um, Jessica will chat you a link. So the Scrum Guide um, talks about the sprint and it'll say it should be one to four weeks. But in practice, I think two weeks is really the sweet spot. And I'll give you a couple of the reasons why. Um, first of all, if you have a really long sprint, a lot of the teams we see get caught up in a lot in replanning. 
what happens is it's too long of a time and they're more likely to actually miss their sprint goal because they have emergent work or they have these pop-ups that happen. Um, and because their sprint is so long, they actually end up having to replan. So there's more time in meetings. They get frustrated because they have this replanning that's happening because they're trying to plan out a larger um, you know, scope of work. It's more difficult to plan everything carefully um, and correctly. Also, they actually have um, you know, less time to reflect, less time to get feedback, less time to talk about you know, what went well and what didn't go well, and less feedback with their customer. So the sprint, again, or iteration is just a time box. It should be one to four weeks, but I think two weeks is really a good, a good place to start if you're just trying out Scrum. Um, also, it should be a consistent duration. So I wouldn't want you to start with you know, two weeks and then change it to four weeks and then change it to one week, um, depending on what's happening on your program. Um, the better approach actually is to have a consistent duration uh, throughout the development effort. All right. The whole point of having a sprint is to get to a potentially shippable product increment. So the team is working, they're executing um, during this sprint or iteration with the purpose of completing something that is potentially shippable, something that's been tested and it's ready to go at the end of the sprint. Um, you can see here on the bottom, I've got this uh, cycle or iterative picture of a, a, what a sprints might look like. So if you can see this very clearly, I'm talking about we're planning, we're designing, we're developing, we're testing, and then we're deploying that shippable product every single sprint. So even though it might be a short duration, like two weeks, um, we're not just developing, we're not just testing, we're actually uh, creating some vertical slice of work that we can ship to the customer that has been tested um, and that is complete. So each sprint has a goal. The product owner is typically the person who develops the product goal with input with, uh, from the Scrum team. And that's actually very clear. It's at the top of the backlog. And it's what the whole team is working towards during that sprint. Sprints enable predictability because it's a consistent duration, because it's this time box we all are working towards and we have a sprint goal. Um, this actually allows the team to be much more predictable. So um, I highly encourage the use of sprints. Also, we inspect and adapt every time. So I'll talk to you about some of the other events here in a moment and you'll see when that's appropriate. But every two weeks, the team is looking at, or every one to four weeks, the team is looking at how did we do and how can we adapt or get better next time? And this reduces risk. Um, not only the fact that we're inspecting and we're adapting, but we're also testing our product much more frequently than in, you know, some of the more traditional types of or development approaches. All right, the next thing I want to talk to you about is the daily stand-up. So this is really a short 15 minute time box um, that happens every day and it's for the development team members. And um, many of you are probably aware of the three questions, but I'll just um, remind you of them. So the first one is, what did I do since we last met to help move that uh, sprint goal, move us towards that sprint goal? So I'm talking to my team members, and letting them know what I did since we last met to move that team towards the sprint goal. And I'm letting them know what I'm gonna do today to help the team accomplish the sprint goal. And I'm bringing up any impediments. So this is like a huddle. It's like really um, the plan for the day. What do I need to work on? Um, how can I get some collaboration going with the team? Are there any, any impediments or anything blocking me, standing in the way of meeting that sprint goal? And if so, tackling those impediments together. Now, again, the Scrum Master will be supporting and helping remove those impediments, but it's not just the Scrum Master that's talking about impediments, it's the entire team. And a lot of times that happens during the daily standup. And again, these are just a couple of pictures of uh, teams that are using the Kanban board. It's really good if you actually stand in front of your physical board during the standup or your tool. It could be JIRA or whatever agile tool you're using. But it's important that you're actually talking about the stories that you have to do today and physically looking at and moving the items that each team member is working on. 
And that helps us keep on track and make sure that we are trying to accomplish those sprint goals and not working on some type of dark work or other thing that's not prioritized in our sprint backlog. All right, sprint planning. Um, last time Jessica drew a picture and it was of an umbrella and she talked to you about yesterday's weather and the fact that it's so important to use, um, you know, the average of the last three sprints in story points so that you have an idea of what is the capacity or the velocity that the teams have so that you can plan appropriately um, for the next sprint. And that's really important. So again, the, the Scrum Master can facilitate a lot in these events. Um, when you know I work with other teams, I tell them that it's really important to have a physical board. And I'm actually going to show you um, something that I did as a Scrum Master. And like I said, with other clients, we actually printed the stickies. We um, took them out of JIRA, printed them, and stuck them on the wall. And I can't tell you how big of a difference it actually made for some of our team members. Um, just having that room um, with the stories on the wall, the physical board, so that we're doing when we're doing sprint planning, everybody understands exactly what it is that we're going to be doing in this next sprint. Um, it's fine to use JIRA or other tools as well. In fact, I typically use both so that you have the reporting capability as well. But the Scrum Master can really facilitate um, and help the team members just to make things visible, make work visible, um, and ensure that there's a good plan. So some of the other things that happen during sprint planning is um, everybody has to understand the sprint goal. Um, everything should be in the backlog, it should be ordered appropriately, and it should be estimated. So we'll talk um, more, well, actually, we talked about estimation last time, and I think I showed you, yeah, I did. I showed you the planning poker cards that typically are used for estimation. So that's something that can happen during, um, well, before sprint planning, and if you have to finish up any estimation, by the time you exit sprint planning, you should have a fully estimated backlog, um, and you should have a sprint goal, and you should know which stories you're going to complete during that sprint and everybody should buy in. This is the time where there shouldn't be questions about the plan when you're exiting sprint planning. The product owner should have described the work. Um, it's estimated we're using yesterday's weather to uh, pull in the appropriate number of points, the appropriate number of work or amount of work. And everybody says, yes, we're good. Um, this is a good plan. I can commit to it. I'm bought in. And that's really important. I think that's something that, you know, we coach scrum masters to make sure that there's that buy-in and that commitment during script planning. Down here on the bottom left of this slide, I also have um, just some metrics. This is just a dashboard that we um, typically use in JIRA. And this is also a good point during sprint planning to show the metrics, like how did we do last time? What, you know, how many days do we have? What is the work that we're gonna do? What is our known velocity? Um, and I think Jessica is going to go into a lot more detail today um, in, in just a little while about metrics. Um, but this is a great time during sprint planning to just review the sprint metrics, make sure everybody knows how we're performing and um, uh, and talk about the goals for the sprint. The next one is the sprint review. Um, so this is also called the demo. What I don't want to see at a sprint review is just a PowerPoint. Uh, so I don't want to see one person up there showing a PowerPoint and just describing what we did and showing a lot of documentation. Um, so that's not the point of the sprint review. The point of the sprint review, which happens at the end of the sprint, is to really demonstrate that working product that I told you was so important. Um, so the people who worked on the product, the development team members actually showing their working software or demonstrating the hardware that they have. Um, develop during the sprint. Um, this is also where we get feedback. It's so important that you invite the right people to the demo. So this can be done by the product owner. The scrum master sometimes can facilitate the invitations. The product owner has to make sure that uh, we know who to invite. So who are the key stakeholders for the product that we've developed this sprint and make sure that they're there and make sure they're there so that we can get good feedback. We can get good feedback. Yes. yes. Uh, so there's a weird echo. You guys hear me still okay? Good. 
Okay, so typically um, we're working to complete a product or a part of a product. And sometimes what we say is that we want a vertical slice of work. So the team is working on something that they can actually demonstrate that includes requirements, design, development, test, and analysis. Um, so last time we talked um, on the last webinar, we talked to you a lot about how to architect that vertical slice of work. And we uh, really tried to emphasize the importance of including at least a couple of these slices and especially test. Um, so we talked about test-driven development and the fact that we should um, think about the test that we have in mind that we're going to complete by the end of the sprint so that we have something that we know is has been tested and is working. And then we demonstrate it at the sprint review or the demo. Okay, the retrospective. Um, so this is an important role because this is where the team really understands and talks about what went well and what didn't go well. And um, I would say that actually it embodies the agile spirit because we're always trying to continuously improve and get better. Um, and how can we do that if we don't understand what went well and what didn't go well? Um, so there's a lot of different ideas out there. If you Google, you know, scrum retrospectives, uh, you could do the starfish or you could use the sailboat. Um, there's a ton of really fun ways to conduct retrospectives. Um, I, you know, I have some teams that just didn't want to talk a lot and I had to like drag them, you know, out, drag the information out of them and others where, you know, they're throwing stickies on the wall like it was second nature and want to discuss everything. Um, so you can switch it up a little bit using some of these techniques. Um, the typical just, you know, kind of vanilla retrospective is literally just saying what went well, what didn't go well, and what could we do better next time. And the goal of the retrospective is to highlight, choose one thing called a Kaizen, which we'll implement in the next sprint. And so this is so that the team is always getting better. Um, I like the starfish, so people just put stickies or jot things. If you're if you're doing remote teams, then you could use some of the collaboration tools like Miro or Mural, and you could have them jot down things that they want to do more of or keep doing or doing less of. Um, the sailboat one is the one that we use a lot in our classes. It's kind of like the driving winds or the good things on the top. And then what are the anchors or the impediments that are really dragging the team down? And then again, we vote as a team on what is the one thing we could do, one small thing that we could do next time to get better. Okay, and then the next thing I want to talk about is backlog refinement. So if you look at the Scrum Guide again, which Jessica chatted you the link, um, you'll notice that backlog refinement is not currently one of the Scrum events. Um, I understand that they're updating the Scrum Guide and that's actually going to change. So look out for the next revision of the Scrum Guide, but currently it's not, um, it's not a Scrum event. However, I would say that it's actually one of the most important things that teams can do. Um, when I'm working with teams uh, and they're not doing backlog refinement, it is very, very evident because when they get to sprint planning, it's a struggle. People don't want to sit there for these long meetings. They don't understand what's in the backlog. The backlog items are not clear. They might not be prioritized appropriately. Um, they might not be estimated. So the team is like dragging, trying to get through this sprint planning. Um, so what's much better is if you could uh, do, do backlog refinement throughout these iterations. So the team gets to decide how and when to do backlog refinement. A lot of times, product owner is the person responsible for maintaining the backlog and doing backlog refinement, but they'll pull in the team as well to make sure that everybody understands the scope, um, that they know what's in the product backlog, that it's estimated, and they also take the time to um, look at the roadmap and the higher level vision. Jess, did we have some questions? Oh, you're muted, I think. Still muted. <laughs> Okay, I'll keep going, but I think there's some questions, so I'll let her uh, let her take take a second there. Um, so during backlog refinement, the team is adding detail, they're adding estimates, and they're ordering the backlog. Um, a lot of times, we we coach teams to do something called user story mapping. I think last time we had shared this book with you, um, but I'll show you again. If you're not familiar with user story mapping, this is one that Jessica and I come back to over and over and over um, to make sure that 
um, we're seeing the big picture, mapping out the stories. You good, Jess? I still can't hear you. Okay, um, yeah, so that's another book that we love and we use user story mapping all the time. One good time to do it is during backlog refinement. Um, I would say that there's many different types of backlog refinement. Um, so you can be looking at the big picture, you could be drilling down, looking at the details. Uh, and this is where the scrum teams decide how often do they want to do this type of activity, but they're always keeping the product vision and the goals in mind. So it looks like there's some questions. Um, I'll just take a look at the chat since I couldn't hear her. It says, I see PO, so the product owner and scrum master to be mostly LOE, so level of effort, ceremonies, backlog refinement, et cetera. If so, this implies the associated budget and scope would still be outside the capabilities, control accounts, and work packages. Can you elaborate on best practices associated with these LOE efforts? I see programs wanting to embed support within the control account or well capabilities or control accounts, but it seems best to have them sit in a separate overarching structure. So I've seen it done both ways. Um, it, typically, if you're thinking about program management, like the normal PMO where you would have your control account manager, a lot of times that um, that type of effort is a level of effort. And I could see if you wanted to lay out some of the scrum events, which include the backlog refinement and the sprint planning and things like that, as a level of effort, that would make sense. Um, I have seen other organizations where their customer and the, the contractor are um, definitely on the same page with this is the approach that we're going to use for developing the product and that it's just an integral part of developing that capability. Um, so I would say that either way is okay as long as it's uh, well understood by the customer. And I would say that typically, you know, on traditional program management is type is an LOE effort. So I could see how that could be rolled up and um, baselined as an LOE activity rather than part of the capabilities um, specifically. So hopefully that answers your question. If not, uh, go ahead and chat back or unmute. That's fine too. So thanks for the question. All right, then um, I've told you about the roles. I've told you about the events and the last part of this 353, uh, which I like to call it when we're describing Scrum, is the artifacts. So I'm going to talk to you about the product increment, the product backlog, and then the sprint backlog. And I actually do get a lot of questions about the product increment, the product backlog, and the sprint backlog. Um, so the product backlog, as I mentioned before, is everything that you have to do to complete the scope of work for that product that you're developing. There might be many teams working on this effort, and it might be months and months or even years um, of work, potentially, especially on these big Department of Defense programs. So the product backlog, again, is the entire scope of work. And what you'll notice is that there's at the top of the backlog, there's a, a smaller chunks of work. They're clearer, they have more detail. Um, whereas uh, if you look at towards the bottom of the backlog, I have everything in there, but the things that are out in the future or at the bottom of the backlog is bigger scope. It's bigger chunks of work. Um, you could relate that to planning packages, for example, if you're familiar with earned value. Um, it just, just means that we haven't fully understood everything, you know, down to the detail level yet. Um, we need to further decompose those product backlog items as we get closer and more ready to work on those items. Um, the product backlog should be ordered. It should provide value to the customer. Um, and it should include everything that we need to do. Again, the product owner is responsible for maintaining this and it should be very clear and very descriptive so that if I am a team member and I'm going to look at a story or a product backlog item, I should be able to understand that work. And also customers a lot of times have access to the agile tools, customers or internal stakeholders. So if I'm one of those uh, stakeholders and I'm looking into the backlog, I should understand because it's clear and descriptive. This is the one where I usually get a lot of questions. So it's constantly evolving. The product backlog is not a static document. It's not, uh, it's not one thing and then we just, that's the backlog for the rest of the product or for the rest of the program. It's something that is evolving. And, the, and 
the reason that it's evolving is because we're getting that feedback. We're testing iteratively and often, and we're getting feedback from our customer. So the prioritization might change, or maybe the scope will change. Um, if you attended our first webinar in the series, then I really went into a lot of detail about what is the implication and the impact from an earned value management perspective when the backlog changes. Um, so if you didn't uh, hear that description or discussion and have more questions, let me know. But the backlog is not a static thing. The backlog does um, provide value to the customer. And it, it's actually all of the work that we're providing is listed and described in a way that we know that it provides value. And we're sharing that information with the customer so that we know they agree that it is providing value. Again, we put acceptance criteria and definition of done at all the levels of the product backlog. So if you're looking at uh, you know, the higher level product backlog items, like the version or the epic or the capability, um, that's gonna have acceptance criteria and definition of done. So it's gonna be related to, uh, it's gonna be related to requirements and it's gonna have quality checklists in it. Um, and if you're looking at a story, one particular story, it should also have acceptance criteria and definition of done so that it is clear and so that we make sure that we're um, doing the right thing and that it's a high quality product. And again, it has to be fully estimated. Um, so again, last time we talked about planning poker, I walked you through how to use planning poker cards. Um, and that's really important to know that the product backlog is estimated. And then there's a subset called the sprint backlog. So I told you what sprint planning is. And I said that the teams were looking at velocity or yesterday's weather, and they're pulling in work from that product backlog. And that's called the sprint backlog. So it's what are we actually going to do in this two weeks or this sprint? It's a subset of the product backlog and it belongs to the development team. So the team decides what is what are they going to pull in based on their velocity and what they think that they can accomplish um, and based on their uh, forecast of how much they think they can get done um, using yesterday's weather. It's also a forecast of what functionality will be completed. So other people can look at, um, you know, what, what can we expect from this team in two weeks or in three months? How do we know? Well, we're looking at the sprint backlog. We're looking at the product backlog so that we know what functionality will be done. The team commits to the sprint backlog. Remember I said it's really important that the team has that buy-in and that commitment um, at the end of sprint planning. And that's so that the team is really committed to getting this done in the next two weeks. And it should include all of the work that's necessary to complete that sprint goal. Um, and sometimes, you know, I see this over and over, sometimes teams don't do a good job in sprint planning. And it's like, we just hit start and then, there's stuff that we just thought of or forgot or didn't pull in um, you know, on day one. So it's really important that you do that backlog refinement and a good sprint planning so that you have all the work that's needed in the sprint backlog. Um, all right, and it includes the Kaizen. So at the top of the sprint backlog is that Kaizen or that one thing that you're gonna improve in the next sprint. All right, product increment. So this is everything that we're, we've completed to date and we're sharing this product increment, we're sharing this piece of work that is done, it's complete with the customer. It should be in a usable condition and it should be a step towards our, our sprint goal. So what, what is the goal that we're trying to complete here? What is the vision of this team? And here's a part of that product. Here's a product increment that can be inspected, it can be tested. And of course, we're not going to complete, you know, a helicopter or an unmanned aerial vehicle or a drone in two weeks, but it's going to be a part of it. It's going to be a vertical slice of one piece of scope that can be demonstrated um, that is moving us towards that goal of having a completed product for our customer. All right, and then the last couple slides here just uh, show you the Scrum framework. Again, I highly recommend looking at the Scrum Guide. Um, I talked to you about all of these things, and this is just kind of a summation here. So um, again, you start with the product backlog, which is everything that you need to do to complete this product. Um, the sprint backlog, which is a subset of that, the stories that you're going to complete in this sprint. You do sprint planning with your team. You're thinking about what are the stories we're going to pull in. You're doing a daily stand-up every day, which is a maximum time box of 15 minutes. Here's what we're gonna do today. Here's the impediments and challenges we need to tackle today. 
Um, then you do the sprint review. So that's the demo. You're showing the customer, you're getting feedback. A retrospective, so you're thinking about continuous improvement. What's that Kaizen? How are we as a team going to get better? Um, and then the three um, roles, product owner, scrum master, and development team that I talked about. And then if you're going through this iterative cycle, um, you'll have a product increment at the end of each sprint. And then the last slide in this section is all about the scrum values. And I see this as really important when you're implementing something new like agile or scrum, you really want to focus on the scrum values when you're thinking about culture and you're thinking about changing the way that you're doing work. Um, you're thinking about commitment, commitment to scrum, commitment to each other, commitment to the work that you're doing, courage courage to bring up those impediments, courage to make work visible, um, focus, so having a prioritized backlog, working on one thing at a time, focusing on that to completion, instead of having a ton of work in progress or all these other things you're distracted by. Openness, that's really important to have a really high performing, close knit team, being open with each other and being respectful. Respectful of each other, respectful of the process. Um, you can look up more about the Scrum values uh, in the Scrum Guide again. And there's also a book that I wanted to share with you, um, which is called the Scrum Field Book. And this has a lot more information about Scrum. It's got some really good case studies. Um, it's by JJ Sutherland. Um, and it's a great book I highly recommend about Scrum. So I think that's it. Uh, and if you guys really want to learn more about Scrum and you actually are looking for a certification, then Jessica and I are teaching a licensed Scrum master and a licensed product owner workshop in just a few weeks. And we uh, are doing that virtually. It's a really awesome, highly interactive class. We use some pretty cool collaboration tools like Miro and Mural. So you're participating in games. And we've had a lot of fun and a lot of success with these classes. Um, so if you're interested, let us know. Um, we are offering a 20% discount to you for attending this webinar. Um, so if you want to sign up, then you can go to our website at radicallybetteragile.com or email us for more information. All right. So Jessica is going to teach Introduction to Kanban. I can't hear you. I don't know if she's muted or what is going on. Let's see. Um, bear with us just for a second. I could hear you earlier, Jess, but not now, so. Hear me now. Hello? <laughs> okay. I was prepared to talk about Kanban, but I didn't want to steal your thunder, so. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. All right, so I'm very excited to talk about Kanban, and then I'll move right from there into Agile Metrics, which I know you're all very, very um, excited to learn about. So um, I actually have a couple of props with me today, so I'll try to make sure that you are able to clearly see what I'm showing, and just let me know if you have any questions about what um, I show you in today's session. All right, so the first thing I'd like you guys to understand is really where Kanban comes from. And if you've never seen the picture of this guy before, he's a huge agile influencer. His name is Taichi Ono, and he was an industrial engineer at Toyota. And we all know how awesome and agile Toyota's production floor is. He actually helped develop their Kanban systems, which are used to improve their manufacturing efficiency. And so when I like to talk about Kanban, I like people to think of a couple of things. One thing is just enough, just in time. It comes from a lean concept. Um, if, if you have a Six Sigma background, then you'd be familiar with kind of what I'm referring to. Um, all right, so the Japanese term um, that we use, the Kanban cards, it comes from these little cards that they use in their, their factories. Um, and it helps them know when they need to do things like restock, 
um, et cetera. And it's also used to let you see how the work is visually flowing through their manufacturing floor. So where this concept comes from is actually an American grocery store. Um, so Taichi Ono was actually in America and he was in a grocery store when he noticed a very interesting thing about the way that the produce and the products on the shelves were stocked by employees. He noticed that they were not restocked or re replenished until cards at the very bottom of the, bottom of the um, let's say like the eggplant here. Uh, there'd be a colorful card in there and when you can visually see that card it indicates when you need to go to the back of the store and pull produce and you know replenish the eggplant stock. So when he saw this, he thought, well, that's a great technique for my production floor. I can have these Kanban cards and they're inside of the um, my, my little uh, work cells. And whenever I'm out of like bolts or screws, I, I see the cards. I know it's time for me to restock it just enough, just in time. Um, so when we start talking about Kanban cards, I really want you to start to understand where this concept comes from and how you can use it and benefit from it too. So here's the really, really cool thing is Kanban doesn't require you to take a bunch of expensive classes and become a master of Kanban. Um, there are some wonderful books out there. This is one of my favorites. It's called Personal Kanban that really show you a few of the simple techniques I'm going to teach you today that anybody can do. And you don't need to have a whole new team of people to do it. You don't need to have product owners, scrum masters, team members. Um, you just need to have people that are willing to make their work visible. Um, so Kanban starts with where you are right now, and it respects everyone's roles. If you're a systems engineering manager, um, if you're a project manager, it, it respects your roles, how they exist today. So there's no functional change. It also encourages everyone to look for opportunities to improve process and flow in the way that you do work. So it really empowers everybody. And the third thing is it's a pull system. So no one's ever going to push work to me. I'm going to work to my own capacity and I'll pull work from my queue when I'm ready to move it into the next phase. Um, so the benefits of pull systems, I don't know if you've seen a lot about pull versus push systems, but there's really a lot of, of benefit in having, it's more efficient. Um, having a pull system allows your, your employees to tell you when they're ready to take on more work and they're faster and more efficient when they work in that way. So this book, Personal Kanban, is one I definitely recommend. If you were to take a tour of my house, you would see Kanban boards my kids have created for their schoolwork now that COVID-19 um, is in full force. We're doing school from our house. Um, so they're flowing their work through there. And you'll see my husband and I both have Kanban boards where we, we um, take our professional work that we're doing and we flow it through the phases so that we can see um, really where our bottlenecks are and become more efficient. So I want to show you something really cool about getting started. So there's three steps. If you want to get started with Kanban in your professional or personal life, here are the three steps you need to take. The first one, set up your Kanban board and I'll show you how to do that. The second one, create your Kanban cards. The third one, set your WIP limits. Um, and there are benefits to each one of these stages. So the first one we'll talk about is your Kanban board. And I've actually made a really cool prop here. Let me zoom in so you can see it. I even cut these little mini stickies for you guys. But basically the first step of setting up your Kanban board is to um, decide what are your column headings. And the way I like to do this is simple. Do it on a piece of paper, I don't know, do it on your wall, but just not in permanent marker. Um, you you want to think about what are all the phases that my work goes through. And I do this with each different type of work. So start with one type of work that you do repetitively over and over. Um, and then write down all the phases. Like first I have somebody tell me they need me to do the work. Then I take that work and I make sure I understand what it, what's the acceptance criteria. Um, then I'm actually starting to work on it now. This is when I pulled the work. Um, and here I'm waiting for somebody to sign off on my work because my manager needs to review it. Um, and here I'm actually doing a departmental review or a peer review or some kind, and now I'm done. These are the phases of my work. And the, the, the number one step is actually just capturing what those phases are. Super easy, guys. You can do this, I promise. 
So your columns are not going to look the same as someone else's columns um, unless we're doing the same types of work and they go through the same phases. And I thought you might ask me, what are some examples that Denise and I see when we help set up Kanban teams? Here's some very common ones. It really depends on the type of work you're doing, but we might see things like backlog, ready for code, um, ready for development, ready for QA, et cetera. Um, so you'll identify what those columns are and you should really make sure if you want this to be of any real purpose that these phases actually reflect the states of work now as they exist, not how you want them to be. So if I want it to be where I can just finish my work without peer review, but in real life I have to get a peer review, miss, causing something to be missing from a column to not be here would mean that I wouldn't be able to track how my work's actually flowing through um, the process. The next step is really to create Kanban cards. So this is really fun activity. I find it captivating. If you are like me and you're one of those individuals who has a notebook like this um, and you, you constantly have found yourself throughout your career with lists like this of things you have to do, Kanban is for you. I'm just telling you, it's gonna make it easier for you because it's like that list, but now it's just way more visual, the progress you're making towards that list. So you're gonna create a whole bunch of cards that reflect the work that you need to get done. And they'll come from two places. The one that I have here, customer driven, that's really appropriate for things like your help desk or a place where you have constant queue of tickets. Like somebody else is deciding for you, what are all the things you need to work on? Planning driven is what I just showed you in my notebook, how I'm coming up with right now, I know 50 things I need to get done. I would take those 50 things and that's what I populate my Kanban cards out of. And your backlog, when you finish this activity um, at the first blush, it probably takes you anywhere from a couple hours to a couple of days to just write down, here's everything I have to do. And in some ways, this just makes life easier because all of this stuff is in your brain and now you're visualizing it and you're getting it out in the open. Um, so you're going to go from your board and the next state of maturity. So start with your Kanban board, really simple like this. But when you're ready, start to think about a few other things. So I'm going to layer stuff on and I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, but you also have the ability to do um, swim lanes. So the nice thing about the swim lanes here is that I can use things like priority. Perhaps you sometimes get urgent emergency work. This is like my expedite column. So when I decide to pull work, I may decide to expedite or I, it may be something that's just routine maintenance or a bug or business requirements. So putting in swim lanes gives me more granularity in tracking the different phases. And now I can also track the different priority levels of the work. So that can make it even easier for me because if I only have a limited amount of availability and I'm pulling work, chances are I'm going to pull things from the top before I work on things in the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you not have a? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, Jess, I think it's okay. I think maybe a couple people were having connection issues, but I can hear and see you fine. Um, so, sorry. oh, very good. Okay. Yeah. And you know what, guys, this will be recorded. I apologize, you know, that you can't at times um, see, but hopefully you're following along. All right. So, if you have the priority one, Denise, why don't you stick on here so you can? um you know keep me queued up okay and then the third one i would say is when you're even more ready another way to, to layer on swim lanes is actually through um products so like different types of work perhaps i need to keep track of not just the phases my work's flowing through but how i'm doing with the products perhaps one product gets more attention than another product because it's higher priority. Um, so there's different ways for you to organize your Kanban board and it makes all the difference. So start with this and then work up to your swim lanes. And so here's why um, we actually have a third step. So the third step here is all about limits. And I wanna explain this to you because when I first learned about Kanban, I didn't understand why we were limiting the way that this formula teaches you to limit. Um, so first of all, the reason why you may say that I only want to have two Kanban cards at any time in one of these phases is because it actually increases focus. And the more you focus on something, the more quickly you're going to finish it, the faster you finish it, the better the overall time for the product that I'm developing. Um, so whip limits help the team focus on working things to done and driving it to the next phase. 
So when we talk about WIP limits, um, I want to introduce you guys to something called uh, the Weinberg Table of Project Switching. So can you guys see that? The Weinberg Table of Project Switching Waste? Okay, good. So the reason why I'm going to introduce that is because this is actually what happens when you are working on one project at a time, your work time for that project is 100%. And the loss of your ability um, to focus is zero. So you're just focused 100% on everything. Um, everyone can hear me good, right, Denise? Okay, good. If you get two projects, watch what happens. Now your, your, pro your amount of working time for each project is 40%. And I've lost 20% to switching between the two things constantly. Anything below two is becomes really wasteful. And what Kanban is about is eliminating waste and bottlenecks so that you have a good flow and you can get work through your process faster. So this is why the golden rule, rule that we've got demonstrated here is that you should actually at any point in time only have two things in each column for each team member that you have that can work in that phase. So if Denise can only work on uh, the review section, let's say she's my manager and she signs things off for me, I can only put two tickets at a time in this column um, because I put a whip limit on it. Now, if there were two people that could review, I could have up to four in a column at, the, at a time. So what we're trying to do is keep everybody operating within this threshold so that they're efficient, okay? Good. I think people are still with me. <laughs> so why do we want to use Kanban? Why do we want to limit what people are working on? We want to decrease le the lead time so we can get work through our process faster. We want to um, make sure that we're limiting our work to what we're capable of doing with the skills that we have on our team. We want to keep work flowing so you don't have huge queues piling up. Um, if you have huge queues piling up, that means someone's idle and someone's really busy. Um, and then also it's a stable and healthy, sustainable way to work. So I really encourage you checking out, um, once again, the personal Kanban book here that I showed you and thinking a little bit more about Kanban itself. And I will say one interesting thing about all of this is that Scrum uses a Kanban board. It's not actually Kanban, but it's a Kanban board in that it has phases. Usually it's three to do in progress done or four to do in progress in review and done. And it's usually that simplistic, whereas Kanban is going to have a lot more columns because you want to reflect all the phases that your work go, goes through. You said is the efficiency threshold chart you just showed in the personal Kanban book. Um, no, it's not actually that little hand drawn chart that I have here. The only place I've ever truly found that is if you Google it. Um, so I will make sure that you get an, in the email the Weinberg table um, project switching chart. Um, so yeah, that's a really useful thing. I do enjoy that and it helps me remember when I'm trying to multitask why I shouldn't and why it's less efficient. All right, guys, so what can we do to help your organization? Um, well, Denise and I both know how to help launch Kanban teams and set up the um, appropriate columns. And we're also really good at something called workflow visualization. So we can actually assess all the value streams at your company and how work is flowing through them. So we can help you identify systemic bottlenecks and improve your process. All right, so Agile metrics. I know you guys love this. I love this. I can't help but love this topic. It's like one of my favorites. Um, my financial and program management background just gets really giddy when I think about Agile metrics and how it can help you guys um, get better visibility into how your projects are performing. And I'm going to just compare and contrast the types of reporting you can get from EVMS and Agile. So EVMS gives you a lot of monthly status reports. So let's talk about that. We have our schedule status, our forecast, our baseline change, changes, our risks, and our management reserve. In section one and section two of this series, we talked about how all of that data and information um, from Agile can enrich your earned value reporting. So we, we highly value our earned value reporting, but we want to also, since we have all of this data and it's in live dashboards, we want to also add on some agile metrics so that we can see things like how is our, our scrum teams performing? Are they driving towards outcomes, shipped products um, to the customers? Are we getting features and functionalities for all these story points they're working on? And so agile is going to give you a lot of the insight into the team level performance where earned value is going to provide that overarching picture 
because most of the, the contractors or customers that we interface with, they see agile and then a whole bunch of non-agile on the same contract. So we need something that can oversee both your agile and your non-agile pieces. And then we need to really be able to deep dive into the um, what's going on in your agile world. All right, so I wanna talk about common reports. Um, so you should have an agile tool, I hope you do. And if you don't, Denise and I would be happy to recommend some for you. This um, report dashboard that I'm showing you right here is very standard. There's a velocity chart um, and you use that to make sure that there's good practices happening, that the team isn't over committing to work or stressing um, and that they're using yesterday's weather. You have a burn down chart, which that's how a team uh, can, can see their trend analysis of completing work and be able to tell you when they think they'll be done with something. And then the third thing that I'm showing you is how you might have something bigger like a control account and show how much longer it's going to take to be able to complete that control account. So here's three little standard reports in this dashboard. We're going to go so much deeper than that today on these and I've actually got some nice little hand drawn examples that I can't wait to share with you. Um, so the first one is predictability metrics and I want to just give you an overview of the types of metrics we're going to talk about today. So the first one is predictability stability, improvement, return on investment, quality, and efficiency. And I don't want you to get overwhelmed that there are so many options um, because if you um, have read our articles or seen a lot of what I say about at, uh, the Agile metrics, we want you to pick one or two from each category that reinforces the type of behavior that you're looking for in your teams. Every metric is actually designed to enforce a behavior. Um, and we also experiment with metrics. So I may implement a metric this quarter and remove it if I don't get the right behavior happening within the teams. Um, so predictability, let's talk a little bit about that metric. I want to go beyond velocity and burn down charts. And what I really want to be able to answer is your team just told me it's going to take 4000 story points to complete my work on this contract. Um, so how do I know for certain that you'll be able to tell me how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost accurately. Um, so here are some of the ways that I can feel confident that you are predictable and your team can rinse and repeat through work and it's no problem. Um, the first one is sprint goals. Actually, I have some cards here um, to show you. So first of all, we talked about product roadmaps right here. Um, we talked about that in day one and in parts of day two. So you want to have a product roadmap. If you don't have one, please inquire because you should have one. Um, it should have your traditional milestones. So those may be from your WBS or your IMP. Um, th these are predefined pieces of scope sorry, you're, you're in, and then the scope is in the WBS. Um, so in this case, I've got four releases on top, and then I have my control accounts in pink or my epics. Um, I have my, uh, maybe, maybe even this is a higher level, sorry, like themes or capabilities. I have my epics or control accounts, and then I have my features or work packages. And really why I would want to implement a sprint goal metric is I want to be able to look every sprint and you can get your agile tool to do this. I want to be able to see like every sprint, are you meeting your goals or are you not meeting them? That's what I want to know. So for all of my teams, I want to know, are they meeting it or are they not meeting it? And here's why, um, because really this is going to be something that helps hold them accountable. So when you come to your demo and you're demonstrating product, I want to know, did you meet your sprint goal or not? Um, and also a sprint goal is something that binds the whole team together. It's like your team play that you practice for your football um, game. You want to make sure that everybody's incentivized to work together to accomplish the sprint goal. And this is something super easy that you can get right out of your agile tool. Um, every retrospective you, or sprint review, your scrum master can track whether or not you met the sprint goal. And it's a good way of letting everyone know at your sprint review what you plan to do in the next sprint and whether or not you met it for the past sprint. Um, so I highly recommend that goal. Plan to done. That's another great metric. So plan to done is actually going to show me as well if you're actually going to hit these releases. So you're planning on doing all this work and you're planning on hitting these different releases. But how do I know that you're actually going to hit it? And so one of the ways that I like to track that is by looking at what are all the stories. So if you can imagine all these different colors I'm showing you are different stories. 
Um, and we look at, at the end of that two week sprint, what did you actually accomplish? I can see that these four stories actually never got done. So that's actually gonna directly impact for the team, uh, their ability to hit those releases. So this is an early indicator of potentially a schedule variance. Um, and it would be something that I would definitely be interested in if I was a, a CAM. So the other thing here is that we want to make sure that the team isn't doing something bad called overcommitment. So I want to make sure that the team is not saying we can do more work than we actually are capable of doing because it makes people burned out and they're not working at a sustainable pace. They're trying to work all through the night to get their work done. And another thing I want to look for is if the work's not getting done, then certainly there was impediments, things that slowed you down. So are we taking action when we know that we're not going to be able to meet our sprint goal? Are we taking action to remove our impediments? So a lot you can get from that. Um, context switching. We just talked about the Weinberg table of project switching. Um, we don't want to do that. So one thing you can do in your Agile tool is look at the number of different projects and pieces of work that are worked in a sprint and make sure that your teams aren't working on tons of different things at once because they're really going to be inefficient. And your goal is to get them really working efficiently and effectively. Sprint work fluctuations. Um, you know, this one kind of just makes me smile because I actually have been a scrum master on teams that were emergency firefighting teams. So most of their time was spent with unplanned work. Um, they'd start, they'd have a sprint goal, we'd be interrupted mid sprint and there'd be all of this urgent work that they have to do because wow. they're full of subject matter experts who were the only people in the building who could solve the problem. Um, so what we started to do with that team was make a buffer, and I highly recommend that. So you want to look at last sprint, what were we able to accomplish that was planned, and what of that work was emergency work that popped up. So let's plan from now on that 50%, let's say it was 50%, 50% um, of our capacity is reserved for unplanned work that we know is going to happen. But this way you're still getting the benefits of Scrum because you still have your um, your retrospective where you're thinking about continuously improving. And we were able to come up with creative ways to automate and get rid of some of that firefighting work that we wouldn't have gotten rid of if we were just doing Kanban. Um, okay, so that's sprint work fluctuation. Velocity. If you have a team that is, uh, you know, huge amount of story points, one sprint and small amount the next sprint, that gives you an indicator that you need to get your Agile coach digging into that. So if I were an Agile coach and I saw a team with a lot of done work and then a tiny amount of done work, I would go to that team and start asking questions. Um, I'd be looking for, you know, is this a matter of not using yesterday's weather, like not properly planning and not properly committing to the right amount of work? Or is it that we have big stories that are not actually something that can be finished in that two week time frame? If that's the case, then I need to help coach my product owners on how to make nice vertical slices of work that's demonstrable in a two week time frame. And then the burn downs and the burn ups, those are great. I love the burn downs and burn ups, keep those. Um, just know that, that it's not the whole picture. You're gonna want to, I use burn downs and burn ups as early indicators of who I need to talk to and when I need to talk to them. Uh, but I never perfectly look at a burn down chart and say, yep, that's the date. I go and say, all right, Here's what I'm seeing. It looks like you're going to deliver early. Um, why is that correct? Do you think that's correct? And why do you think that is? Or if you're going to deliver late, is this correct? Or is there something you know that I don't know? And then the backlog. I love this. If I could highlight that one, I would highlight it. Um, so you tell me that a product is going to take you a thousand story points. And then two months later, I go into the backlog and it's 1200 story points. And two months later, I go in and it's 1600 story points. What's happening? Am our, do we have scope creep there? Do you have like a giant large scale estimate that was stuck in there and you weren't taking away story points because any of those things could happen? I would be digging in to find out what's going on. Are we adding a bunch of scope or is there something wrong with the way that we're handling our reporting? So these are good metrics. Um, Denise, uh, I saw she chatted you guys the link for um, digging in and looking at some of the metrics we have in our article and I highly recommend that. So the next one um, is actually going to be, oh, I see Vic, you have a question? Let's see. 
where is the budget for unplanned emergency work coming from? Management reserve, or is it, uh, yes, yeah, so this, Vic's question is, where is the budget for unplanned emergency work or the buffer coming from? Is it management reserve or is it considered upfront during budget planning? And I will say, Vic, that that's a great question and it's super varied. So when I talk about emergency work, it could be work for a completely entirely different project um, where you have a subject matter expert who gets stolen to support other, other things when they have problems. It could also be a person who has a lot of legacy product experience. And so they're getting asked to, to jump off the team and help with something that's not planned. So in that case, it has nothing to do with the contract or the program you're working on right now. It's another, it's the funding's coming from another pool. Um, now, when we talk about it being risks or bugs or something that popped up with the product you're currently developing on that contract, then yes, we're going to look at things like management reserve. Is this a known unknown? What, it, what is the impact of this? And it will come from different places depending on whether it's something that you have in your risk register or if it's something that's completely brand new work that you didn't know you were going to have to do. Denise, do you want to add anything to that or? Uh, no, I, I think you answered it great. I just wanted to make sure we're good on that um, and that you saw the question. So I agree with everything that you said, Jessica. It really depends on the situation and I think you covered it. So hopefully we answered your question, Vic. If not, then just chat and we can further expand on that. Awesome. Okay. I hope you guys are enjoying this. This is like a, a deep dive into some metrics for those of you that really like metrics. Um, okay, so stability. Happy teams are more efficient, and that's super true. If you didn't know that, oh, you know it now. Um, I actually have a cool card here somewhere. Find it. Yes, right here. If you don't do this already, here's a best practice that I'm going to teach you. Um, it's something to be done in your retrospective. So what you want to do is basically take a survey and you have each team member do this in the uh, retrospective. You say, what is your happiness level in your current role on the team? And then you might also have another question like, what is your happiness role with the company? And they, they rate it on a scale of one to 10. And here's the reason why you should care about their happiness level on the, on the or their role on the team and their role in the company is this is an early indicator when people are flight risk and they're not going to be retained by your company. They're not getting enough career growth. Um, and then on the other side, when you're asking how happy are you with your role in the company, this is an early indicator for you of cultural impediments when there's big problems happening that the team's frustrated by um, and that there's going to be a downswing in your productivity in your agile team productivity. So we kept track of this and it was great. Every sprint, we could get a pretty good feel of how our teams were going to perform. And there's a strong correlation between velocity and happiness. Okay. Heroism, super easy to find that one. Um, typically it, the time charging system reveals when you have like a subject matter expert, sometimes these people don't wanna be the hero. They're just the hero because there's a ton of scope and they're the only ones who can solve that problem. And so they're typically charging a lot in the time charging system. If you look in the agile tool, they're typically the ones pulling a lot of the work. And why we wanna look for that is because this gives us an opportunity to eliminate some of our organizational risk by creating redundancy. So wherever we find a subject matter expert who's overworked, we want to create somebody with the same or similar skill sets. And that protects us from things like them moving to a different company um, or them getting burnt out and not wanting to work with you anymore. Um, so heroism is not a good thing. And we definitely want to monitor that because it's going to ruin the stability of your teams over time. Um, project prioritization, that's another fun one. Uh, you might have a portfolio that's full of lots of different work. And when somebody takes that project from their top number one role and moves it down, how many of you have resources yanked off of your program or your contract? And you found out like, with one of those staffing reports, right? Um, so we want to check the project prioritization and make sure that we're getting those projects in the right order so that they're worked and they have enough staff to accomplish their need by dates and the promised dates that, that you already have on your roadmap. And the attrition rate. So this is something that's more at your portfolio level, but it was something I, I was very involved in at my prior company. 
And that was making sure that you are cutting things off. When you have something that's no longer a good return, you want to make sure you're cutting it off before you've wasted a lot of energy on working on that. And your product owners actually do a lot of prioritization so that they can cut that off. And if you could just take a minute to mute your mic, I'm getting a little feedback, that'd be good. Okay, so why do you care about stability measurements? That's because if the teams aren't working at a sustainable pace, then you're gonna actually have problems with them delivering to the, to the agreed upon schedule. Okay, just try to mute the mics, there we go. Okay, continuous improvement, um, that's, that's the key here. We wanna make sure that we're continuously doing better. Um, so one thing you can do to encourage your scrum masters getting good practices happening um, is you can measure Kaizen. And whenever your teams find a good Kaizen, you can, um, I'm sorry, just one second. Let me try to see if we can fix this. Yeah, I'm not sure. It is very, um, like you said, there's an echo or something going on, so. All right, let me try that. Is that good? Okay, actually that's bad. All right, so we wanna make sure that we're getting good Kaizans and we're improving. And then we also wanna make sure that we're getting skill growth and saturation. So when you finals bottlenecks, you wanna make sure that you're getting redundancy created. So Denise is actually gonna teach you a, a skill after this, which is all about staffing and making sure you have the right people on your Agile team. Um, the next thing after that is maturity assessment. So Denise and I, this is how we prove to companies when we come in that we've made a huge difference in increasing their knowledge saturation across their teams. I don't know. I'm sorry, guys. We're having some audio problems. Please, can you mute your mic? Yeah, I'm not sure what is going on with that, Jess. I don't know, I've hit mute all, so I, I've hit that a couple of times. So I apologize, guys, I know that's frustrating. It's frustrating for me too. Um, so please take the moment to be courteous and mute your line. Okay. <laughs> so we measure agility, and that's basically the three, five, three. Um, so we're looking at the roles, the artifacts, and the events, and we're saying, baselining how the product owner, scrum master, and the team members are doing right now at being agile. And that helps us when we come in three months later to make sure that they're also being agile, like that it's getting better and we're improving. And then adoption is really showing us, is agile catching on? Is it spreading across your company? Um, and we often find that it starts in pockets, but it spreads like a wildfire. It happens fast. Okay. So we want to make sure we're improving so that we can spread best practices, transfer knowledge, and continuously improve. All right, so the next one is all about value. It's about if you're working on something, if your scrum teams are working on something, how do I make sure it's the right work, it's valuable work? Um, and the way we do that is by making sure that we have business value for every sprint or that when I decide to prioritize something higher than another thing as a product owner, that I'm aware of what that delay is gonna cost me in the future. Another thing I like to do guys, if you haven't done this before, this is really a cute little thing. I also made some stickies here. You can tell I have some spare time. Um, but this is what Denise and I do at every sprint review. Um, we basically put a giant sticky pad on the wall if our customers are present and we ask them to take sticky notes and write down what they like, what they don't like about the product we're demonstrating, concerns, risks, thoughts. And they basically just cover this board with sticky notes. And some things are things that they think we're doing well and they want us to keep doing it. And some things are things they just absolutely don't like about the way we went with our design or our concepts. Um, and this lets us really just get a good feel of how we're Yes, whoever that was, can you please mute your line? Yeah, sorry, Jess, I've muted everyone that I can. I think it might be somebody on the phone. I'm not really sure. Other than just asking again to please mute your lines, even if you're just dialed in on the phone. Um, thanks. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, that's actually better. So whoever it was, thank you. Whew, whew. All right. So why do we care about these things? Um, because if our teams are making good progress, 
then it's up to the product owner to make sure they're working on the right things and we're getting value for all that effort that we're putting forth. Quality. This one's really important. Um, so I'm gonna just take a quick minute. Um, so when we talk about quality, I wanna consider things like where are we identifying bugs? Where are bugs coming from? Um, are we identifying them fast enough? Are we finding them inside the team? Like is the team catching their own bugs or is it getting caught later on when we're, when we fully integrated the, the product and we're going through systems level testing? Um, is it being found by the customer? That's important for us to find where our, most of our bugs are getting caught and incentivize it to become sooner. Because the sooner you catch your bugs, the lower cost it's going to be. The more impact it has, the closer it gets to your customer and user. Um, okay, and then impediment resolution. So this is another best practice for you if you don't use this right now. Um, we have an impediment board and this is run by your scrum masters. So when your scrum masters come together every day or every other day, depending on the framework they're using, you want them to create a board where they're tracking P1 impediments. Those are things that are, are blocking a goal or a release. These are the most important ways for you to save time on your contract is by knowing what these things are and getting rid of them or managing them. Um, P2s, those are things that your teams have somehow figured out a workaround and so they're getting it done, but it's way slower than it would have been. P3, these are things that your teams are telling you, look, we did get our work done, but there might be some other work that happens. It's technical debt. It's basically accruing as you're going through the, the program. And these are things you're going to want to have a strategy to tackle and remove. And sometimes that's like best practices, like making sure you have your bugs and you're working through your bugs. And then P4s, those are Im improvement opportunities. So if you want to make things go faster, you're going to work on eliminating these impediments starting at the top and moving down and in my prior company we had a rule if something was on this board and it was there for more than 30 days then it got it got escalated to our leadership team so that they can figure out why it's still there so that's a best practice for me to you that i hope you implement at your organization Okay, and why we care about this is because we want to make sure that we're using agile best practices. We want to make sure we're using peer reviews, peer programming, um, any opportunity where we're testing and, and making sure that we're not just waiting until the end to find out if there's bugs or problems. All right, so efficiency metrics. Um, these are inspired uh, by this book from Daniel Vacanti. It's called Actionable Agile Metrics for Predictability. And I will say I wasn't ready for this book until about three years into my Agile transformation. And that's when I was really just not happy with just burn down charts and velocity. And I really wanted to get to outcomes. In fact, some of my teams had taken on not good practices and they were basically trying to just churn out story points. And I wanted to, to have working product, not story points. And so here's some of the metrics I learned from that book and I encourage you to look up. One of them is throughput. So basically it's the number of items. So think of these as control accounts or you could even do work packages. So if I were to say in a quarter, how many work packages can I accomplish? Um, that would be my throughput. So if I was able to accomplish 10 work, work packages on my contract this last quarter, then I would want to do at least 10, if not more in the next quarter. And this is actually a direct reflection of whether or not you have good flow through your process. The next one is WIP. So if I can show you two different metrics here, um, I'd love to show you some Jira dashboards I've built, but there is a confidentiality piece to it. Um, so one thing I did is I would have teams with dashboards that basically show planned work. So these could be control accounts, work packages, um, and then the ones that they were working on right now and the ones that were actually completed and I could sell or deliver to my customer. I aggregated that so all of the teams, like in this case, maybe there was five or six teams working on one pieces, uh, one main piece of my product. I had the same dashboard, but it was aggregated for all of them. And that allowed me to quickly see which of my teams are doing a good job and have good flow and are basically just pulling small amounts of work, working on it and getting it to done. And which of my teams were pulling a bunch of stuff and weren't actually being effective or efficient. And I could dig into that and help coach that um, so that they did better. The other one is cycle time. Um, so I'll give you a second to absorb this drawing. Basically what I want is I want to be able to calculate the amount of time from when my scrum teams actually start working to when they ship something uh, to, or it's ready to be shipped to the customer. 
that's my cycle time. And my goal is to make that smaller. Um, lead time is what the customer sees. So they don't really care about how long you were working or how long you were waiting. They want to know from the minute that they ask you, they give you a go on your contract to the minute you actually deliver it to them out in the field to the war fighters, how long is it taking me? Which is usually much longer than the cycle time. Um, and then this was a game changer, tack time. Um, so tack time, if I know that I need my teams to deliver something um, in July of 2020, then I can go and look at the velocity and say, okay, I need to have a velocity of 100 story points every sprint if I'm going to meet that date. So this actually helps you if you're a leader decide um, what level of prioritization you need to make it um, so that you can get the right amount of velocity on that piece of work. So this actually changed a lot for our company because now we could go backwards. We could say, okay, I have a need by date here. Based on our current velocity, we're not gonna meet that date. But what can I do to actually get you to meet that day? I can deprioritize something. Um, I can increase your dedication level. I can help get rid of impediments to increase velocity. And that really actually helped us get deliveries to our customers in a more timely manner. That's what it's all about. So efficiency metrics and the metrics that, that Daniel Vacanti talks about in this book will help you focus on the flow of your work and help you identify the things that are slowing you down so you can meet your customers need by dates. Okay. And that was it for Agile Metrics. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, so obviously Denise and I have a lot of experience with doing this at organizations and we'd be super excited to either do some in-house training or virtual training for you. Um, we also coach and we help with framework implementations. So Basically, we're your girls. So if you have something you, we've impressed you with the way we can integrate Agile and earn value, um, we'd love to work with you. So please feel free to reach out. Our next topic um, is actually gonna be about cross-functional teams. And it's not very long because we have a couple of other really cool ones I think you guys are gonna enjoy coming up like skill gap analysis and staffing plans. Um, we've got 30 minutes left and we're just gonna really try to turn through as much of the topics that we have left uh, migrating to cross-functional teams is really an exciting thing for me um, because I've been in a very traditional and waterfall environment and tried to go through this process. And for me to just make it easier for you makes it makes me very happy. Um, so here is heat mapping. Denise and I talked about this a couple of times. And what you need to know is basically heat mapping is looking at all of your functional groups and saying what types of agile they're using how many teams they have, if they have teams, and then running a maturity assessment on what's there. So a maturity assessment for a lean team is gonna be looking at things like throughput, whip, cycle time, the metrics I just showed you. An assessment for a scrum team is gonna be your three roles, your five events, and your three artifacts and how mature they are. Um, Kanban is gonna be focused again on your throughput, whip, cycle time, like bottlenecks, and whether or not they're actually uh, using improvement techniques. And then DevOps is gonna be looking at your development and operations relationship and how you're building in sustainability, in some cases, even security into the product in the development phases. So we have different maturity assessments for that. And I definitely recommend that you look to make sure you know whether or not there's other agile groups in your organization. We are always surprised when we come in and it's the same company and we're working with them in multiple sites and one site's really mature and another site hasn't heard of what the other site's doing. So there's a lot of tools that could be shared, um, tips and techniques, even resources that could be shared between the two and they don't know it until they do this exercise. Another thing is even within the same building, you could have many different contracts that are funded completely different and have no relationship between them, but one is maybe even has a LACE, a Lean Agile Center of Excellence or an Agile Practice and nobody else even knows it. So this is a great way to uncover the resources you already have and chances are you have a lot of them. Waterfall team structure. Um, so we wanna go from having a bunch of people that we only use for a tiny little bit um, and that we sequentially work with. Like I'll do my thing, I hand it to you, you do your thing, we throw it over the wall. And we wanna get rid of that handoff relationship because a handoff equals delay. And we want our large teams to become little small teams that have only small communication pathways. 
because the smaller we get, the more efficient and effective we are at communicating our, what we're trying to um, solve. So we want to get to small teams, six to eight people, um, and we want them to be people that can work together. So what we started to do to become more cross-functional is, especially with our hardware teams, you had to find one or two skills that already have some type of natural relationship or handoff. So in this case, we created electromechanical engineers. And those were really electrical engineers were a good fit to pair with a mechanical engineer because they have the same education. And in many cases, they even have access to the same equipment. So it just makes sense that over time, we would have those two roles work together. That's not to say that an electrical engineer becomes a mechanical engineer or a mechanical engineer becomes an electrical engineer. It's just that those two roles can work well together. And eventually they're much more valuable to the company because they understand both sides. The other skills that we found that were natural pairing are your um, mechanical engineers and your testing engineers. Um, it makes a lot of sense for the people who are building a product to understand also how to test that product. And uh, the same thing for with systems engineers. They understand the whole picture. What better person to have working closely with your reliability engineer or safety engineer um, than someone who understands the whole system? So you need to map out what are the skill sets that you have available to you and what are some natural ways to have them work together on these scrum teams. And so the way that I, I started with that was to create a vision. So here's a vision for the scrum team. Um, and I'm going to get the correct roles to satisfy that vision. And my goal is to have it be an end to end process. So here's an example of a vision for this team scruminators. Um, they actually make motors. That's all they do. They don't develop a whole product. They just make motors and they make them for three different types of drones or unmanned uh, aerial vehicles. And they have lots of different skills here. You, you look at this, you see systems engineering, software, mechanical, quality, electrical engineering they work together to fulfill that vision um, and that's what we call cross-functionality it's not that the electrical engineer became a software engineer it's that they understand the handoff and are very mindful about working together to eliminate those handoffs as much as possible and that gives you time savings hopefully you guys understand that so this is my last slide on this topic and i because i really just want to um you know send you guys um, out with a good understanding. Denise and I both have prior military um, backgrounds. And so we really want to get T-shaped. And some examples of somebody having uh, a wide range of skills is, is in basic training. You learn about um, military comms. So you can use, you can man a radio if you need to communicate. Uh, first aid, you can save someone's life. You learn all of the basic essentials of that. Markmanship, you learn how to fire weapons. Land navigation, you learn how to orient yourself um, in your environment. And then there's depth. That's when somebody's actually specializing in that field. That's when you go in to become a medic or a sniper or special forces. Um, so you can see how there's a huge difference between breadth and depth. And we're not asking, sometimes people think that, we're not asking for you to specialize in a different field. We're just asking that you branch out and understand how your field relates to other fields. All right, cool. And that was it on the cross-functional one. So again, Denise and I um, have mentioned a few times that one of the newest things we do is workflow visualization, and we love doing it because that lets you see how well all these different functional groups are working together and how streamlined your process is. Denise, over to you. All right, thanks. Let's see if I can share the screen. Or can you make me the presenter again, Jess, please? Yes, I just did. Okay. Thanks. It's slowly coming up here, I think. <laughs> Jess, can you let me know when you can see that? Seems like it's a little laggy. I can see it. Okay. Great. There we go. All right. So the, oh, sorry, just one sec. Something weird is happening. Oh my goodness. Okay. 
All right, so we're going to talk to you all about creating an appropriate staffing plan for your Agile teams. Um, so this is, of course, not new. It's, you know, you've always had to have a staffing plan um, for the work that you're going to do. But actually, um, there's some nuances and really best practices that we can share with you when you're agile, when you have scrum teams or other types of agile teams. Um, Jessica and I have worked with a lot of organizations to help them get through creating these staffing plans, making sure that they have a good baseline and a good plan um, to execute the work using agile teams. Okay, so if you're going through an organic agile transformation, or in other words, you really want to um, start developing your agile teams around product, um, then the way that Jessica and I typically coach um, organizations who are doing that is to lay out all of the scope. So this um, is a release plan or a product roadmap that has releases on it that we you know we've kind of made it vanilla but if you imagine putting all of the scope on your wall um, organizing it into releases and thinking about the different types of capability the different types of product that you're developing um, what we would do then is start to pull just one of those capabilities or features really understand what is that scope of work and then start thinking about who are the team members who are the people and the right, you know, skill set, basically, the people with the right skill set um, that we need to actually execute this work. Um, so we've done this for a couple of different programs recently, and it's worked out really well, especially when teams are just starting up or it's a new scope of work or a new program or project, um, you know, that the team that the team is trying to align to. So for example, we put all of the software engineers, all of the firmware people, all of the system engineers, mechanical engineers, et cetera, in a um, different part of the wall using sticky notes. And then when we talked about each feature one by one, we said, OK, for this particular one, as a warfighter, I need my unmanned ground vehicle. Um, it has to have wheels. It has to be installed. It has to have steering control or whatever your product is, then who are the right people or skills that we need to accomplish that scope of work. And we would take a sticky off the wall from, for example, the software engineering side, um, side and we'd say, okay, we need this person and this skill set. And we'd place it around the features that we needed to complete. Um, and, and so that way, it's kind of this organic or natural way of pulling people to work. So you're forming the teams to have the right skill set to accomplish the work and accomplish the really goals for that team that you're setting. Um, now, it's not just a simple quick one for one and all the teams are perfect, you know, but it's a great starting point. Um, and it's a great way to start to have that discussion about what exactly is it that we're trying to build and do we have the right people to do it? Um, and then you kind of move, you know, some people will be overworked, some might not have enough work and stuff like that. So you're, you know, moving the people around um, to have the best possible set of skills um, for each of the teams. And then we talked about, you know, adding on layers of, well, what if there's a SME that needs to support lots of teams and you can adjust the plan? Um, and there's a lot of techniques we can talk to you about that as well. But this is a great way to get started is actually lay out the scope on the wall. Um, you talk about the capabilities, talk about the features that you have to do, and then pull the people and the skills to the work. All right. Yes. And oh, yes, I'm so glad we had that pop up because I might not have remembered to say this very important thing on this slide, which is um, we have to talk about how dedicated can they be to the team and to the program. Um, so we talked about levels of dedications. If I were to zoom in, you'd see um, on the software engineering cards and the firmware cards, each person, it actually has their name, their functional group. And then we talk about um, do they have other responsibilities? Um, within our organization? Are they only part-time to our program? Um, and it, even if they're 100%, maybe they already have other responsibilities within our program. So then how dedicated will they be to the team? 
And, we, and that actually was surprising to some people um, as we worked through this with the program manager and kind of the core team members, uh, there were some surprises like, wait a second, I'm not 50%, I'm only 25% or I have all these other responsibilities. So again, this elicits really good discussion and it allows the teams um, to be formed in a way that's around the product and allows the teams to have all the skills that they need to complete the work to fulfill their team vision. Um, so another thing that we do with our um, scrum teams and agile teams is we actually conduct a skill gap analysis. So Jessica started to talk about it a little bit earlier. Basically what we do is, um, you know, from the agile practice or as, as an agile coach, we would go to each of the scrum teams. We would meet with them um, with each team one at a time, and we would conduct an exercise um, so that we could understand like what gap, what skills do we need for the teams? What skills do we have? And then where are the gaps? And in this way, it allows you to really start to look at that um, capacity plan and match it up with your roadmap to make sure that you do have a solid plan and you have the right people to accomplish the work and produce the products that you need. Um, so just some examples here, of course, if you're doing this on your own, then you would put your own skills that you need and the skills um, that you need within your organization to produce your products. But some examples are, of course, if you're using Scrum, we would have to have product ownership, Scrum mastery skills, and then your more traditional types of skill sets like mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and software. Um, and then we also put things that you might not necessarily think of right away when you're thinking of developing a product, but are extremely important and, and can become bottlenecks and problems on teams, such as um, sourcing skills and quality reliability skills. Of course, having operations, manufacturing, you get the idea. Uh, those, you know, you. Uh, list out all of the skills that you might need um, to produce your product within your organization. So then we talk about each of the teams. So as an Agile coach, I would go in, talk to the Scrum team, and I would say, okay, this is the team vision. In order to fulfill this vision, what skills do we need? What skills do we need to make sure that we have every everything and everyone so that we can have an end-to-end -end product and be as independent from other teams as possible? Um, you'll notice that I have Fibonacci numbers here. So we would actually conduct this meeting just like we would when we did the planning poker. So I would actually take my planning poker cards in and we would talk about we need this skill, we need that skill, more, you know, which one do we need the most? Um, and so we would use planning poker as just a really quick way to see which skills does the, do the actual development team members think that they need to fulfill their vision. So then we talk about what are the skills that we currently have? Um, so we use the planning poker to determine the skills that we know that we have. Um, and then, you know, we have this skill more than any other. We need this skill and have it and use it every day. Or maybe we don't have access to this skill. Um, or, you know, you see, you see what I'm saying. We're trying to uh, assess the skills that we need, assess the skills that we have, and we use it doing this planning poker approach um, so that we know that we have what we need to uh, fulfill the team vision. And by focusing on skill gaps, um, and thinking about the unique types of product and the types of skills that we need, um, that really provides a clear picture and it allows us to determine what types of teams we need later and what types of skill sets we need to grow in order to be successful. Um, so then you can start to um, document this. So we've gone through the planning poker about which skills we need. We know which ones we have and which ones we don't. And then we can start um, looking at those core skills that we need on our team to start calculating, um, you know, the FTEs. So we write down all of the FTEs we need. We write down all of the ones that we have, and then we'll start to be able to see where the gaps are. Um, so in this particular example, you'll notice that the sourcing skills are lacking. So we said that we needed one person to do sourcing and we don't have any, and the same with quality and reliability. So this particular uh, Scrum team actually expressed concern that they couldn't purchase the prototype parts that they needed because they didn't have 
a sourcing person. So they wanted to get their own um, prototype components and they wanted to do that very quickly. And they didn't have a good contact or anybody on the team that could help them with that rapid sourcing. Um, and they also needed a quality person. So this is a very quick way that um, an Agile coach can go to several teams and do this type of assessment to start to see where, uh, you know, where there's a, a gap basically in skills. And then you can look at it at the higher level and start to look across teams and across your organization. Um, so at, uh, if you're familiar with Scrum at Scale, then you will be familiar with the term Metascrum. Um, just in case you're not, you don't know what Metascrum means, it just means team of teams. So in this case, we had lots of teams. We did a, a skill gap analysis like this across many teams. So I'm showing team A, team B, and team C. And you can see that um, we know that team C has those gaps. Remember I said they needed to, they wanted to be able to purchase their prototype components and they wanted to have those sources and quality um, skills within the team to accomplish their uh, vision and they didn't so I can look across the other teams and see do you know is anybody else able to help is there any any other way that we can grow this skill and help team C um, across multiple teams then you can actually take it up even higher. You could look at it at the program level. So as a PM, I could say across all of the Metascrums and all of the teams, um, you know, for Metascrum A or this group of teams, what are the gaps that you have? And you notice that, oh, okay, so there's those same two gaps, but maybe you can fill them somewhere else. So maybe this is where we need to develop some skills internally. Maybe it's where we could do some of that cross training. Um, perhaps we need to hire. Maybe we actually want to put out a requisition for additional sourcing and you know quality people. Um, so it really gives you a lot of insight into the skill sets that you have, and it allows you to make sure that you have um, an executable baseline and a good staffing plan. Um, and you can do it really quickly. And then you can also look at future work. So now that you know uh, what the teams are working on, what skill sets each team needs, which ones you have and which ones are, you know, may have some gaps, then you can start to pull in future work and you can start to see that I can identify out in a future year that I might need to start to develop another team. Jess, do we have some questions? Yeah, one thing I wanted to say in addition to what you just said, Denise, is that we often teach our, our project management team and the CAMs <clears throat> this technique because later on when the customer starts to ask for more requirements or more functionality, this mm -hmm. gives you a really fast, like, what did we get down to? About 30 minutes. They could tell us a new requirement. <clears throat> we could have them use large scale estimation and size it and then we could look at in our staffing plan our skill gap analysis and say roughly when we'd be able to fit that work in we could tell them how much it was going to cost how long it was going to take and what it would delay or what it would remove and <clears throat> it gave us the power to have a better um i don't say expectation management but really make sure that we were clear about look if you add this requirement it's going to cost this much more take this much longer and these other things that you like or want aren't going to get done so i'll say there's a lot of value in doing this type of skill gap assessment and using it when you talk about things with your customer yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, I, I would say there's a lot of benefits. That's definitely one key thing. I mean, you'll know what skills you need across the teams. You'll know what the availability that the teams have to complete existing product. Um, you'll know what types of new teams that you need. Like, for example, what I'm showing here, how do you know what types of teams you need to stand up for future work? And then you'll know the impact of shifting priorities or adding work or requirements, like Jessica said. Um, so definitely it um, is great if your customer wants to add new requirements, especially since we said the product backlog is always shifting and we're always incorporating that feedback. Um, you know, then you can say, yes, absolutely, we could do these new requirements and or we could shift the priority in the backlog. And this could be more important than something else. But by the way, this is what it's had this is how it's going to impact. Um, and we can show that very quickly and pretty easily just by using something simple like this skill gap analysis, um, you know, when it's layered upon your product backlog and your product roadmap. So yes, totally agree. All right. 
Um, and then just to tie it back to earn value a little bit, um, because the, we focused on agile EV integration very heavily in the first two webinar series. And so I just wanted to bring it back a little bit that, um, you know, the reason that we do those gap analysis um, and the skill set analysis um, is to make sure that we have a executable baseline and a good staffing plan and then if you have an earned value management requirement then the control account manager really has to understand how that agile capacity or the skill set analysis that we did aligns with the control account plan um, so it can be it can align very nicely especially if you're looking at it from the capability um, and the feature perspective and then that aligning that to the control accounts and the work packages like we discussed last time um, and you can actually use a spreadsheet like this. Jessica and I uh, use this all the time with customers. We made it kind of vanilla so you didn't have any, uh, you know, any real data in here, but you can see that you can um, determine how much the teams will cost. You know what the departments or the functions that they have are, and you can start to dollarize that um, using those hours turning it into dollars and you can do that analysis to actually help you develop the performance measurement baseline. Um, so we did this, so we've done it many times and can help you if, if this is something that you're looking to do. Um, so we can start with those features as the warfighter, I need latitude longitude position so that I can move my unmanned ground or uh, unmanned ground vehicle to the proper waypoint. So take that functionality, break it down into the teams that are going to be executing that work, understand the employees or the staffing, and turn that those points that are estimated to do that work into hours, and then take those hours and turn it into dollars. Um, so it's kind of a multi-step process that you can do, and it's not something that the actual scrum teams themselves have to do. It's something that your PMO or some type of translation layer, like your control account managers and PMs um, can do. So that then this way, when the control account manager shows their staffing plan and has this baseline, they can back it up with real data and analysis that says, you know, I have the right teams, I have the right staffing, and, and this is a good executable plan. Um, so I hope that helped. Um, we definitely learned about that along the way and have been successful helping lots of teams. Um, so I think Jess showed a similar picture, just kind of throwing out one more plug for all the services that Jessica and I do. Um, we've been really excited to work with a lot of companies across the country. Um, and lately that can include remote or virtual support for agile training, coaching. Um, we do framework implementation. Jessica and I are both Scrum at Scale as well as uh, Scale the Agile Framework. Really, we're kind of framework agnostic. We've helped, um, you know, organizations implement both types of frameworks as well as things like Kanban. Um, and yeah, please reach out to us if you want to learn more about any of these services. So the next topic, oh yes, book a free consultation. That's true. We'll always talk to you for free at first. If you'd like to give us a call and have some questions, we'd love to hear from you. So the next topic is subcontractor involvement with your Agile teams. We just have a couple minutes left, and this is a very short topic. So um, definitely, you know, message us if you have more specific questions. This was the least on your priority list. So, um, but we do see a lot where we go into organizations on these huge programs, and there's um, they have many subcontractors, and the prime contractor is becoming agile or is very agile, and they wonder how can we. Uh, include our subcontractors? How can we align our process with theirs if we're very agile? Um, so one thing that we say and suggest is consider including subcontractors in the Scrum of Scrums. Um, so I briefly talked about the Meta Scrum. This is the Scrum at Scale framework if you wanted to look at that. And it's actually where the product owners at the, uh, the prime contractor are coordinating with the product owners of the teams at the suppliers or the subcontractors. And then the same thing with the Scrum of Scrums. So that would be the Scrum Master Cycle, where they're coordinating and the suppliers or subcontractors are actually Scrum teams as well. Um, you can do the same thing with the Scaled Agile Framework. The SAFE Framework says to actually include the suppliers as an Agile release train, um, as part of your supplier train. And basically the benefits are very similar, which is you want them to have the same cadence. You want to have them um, 
you know, integrated and participating in the planning, the demos, um, and their work is really integrated with what you're doing. So you have that visibility, that alignment, and they're doing things like the inspecting and adapting on the same cadence as the prime contractor. So both of those two frameworks, which by the way, are the most um, popular frameworks out there uh, for Scrum, they both address how to integrate uh, subcontractors or suppliers into the Agile cadence. Um, so this is a picture of when Jessica and I actually ran a PI planning for a client. And uh, so that's program increment planning where we're helping them plan out the next a uh, few months of work and we brought in all of the people across all of the scrum teams and we actually found that the supplier was missing <laughs> there was a major subcontractor that we really needed to bring in to do some integration and to do some work i'll say um, on this particular effort and so it's it was important for us to bring them in and get them on that same uh delivery cadence and agile cadence um, we actually brought them in uh, after having, you know, this this exciting finding in the middle of our PI planning. So it can, it can become an issue if your subcontractors are not integrated. And if they're not agile, you can still integrate them as well. You can still say that, um, hey, we're using this agile uh, development approach. This is the cadence that we're on and you establish specific delivery dates, um, you know, that you can integrate into your agile teams. If, if you've ever heard of a service level agreement, it could be similar to that. Um, and then you might actually go on site if there are if there are delays and issues even if your subcontractor is not agile you can still use some of the techniques the lean and agile techniques like gamble walks to help you manage that subcontractor and then Jess, I think you actually already showed this one before, but I'll just, uh, it's the last slide, so I'll just give a couple uh, of plugs here for looking at things like cycle time and using some of the um, metrics that Jessica talked about, including your subcontractor when you're looking at the entire value stream and you're trying to remove that waste, then I highly recommend using, uh, not looking just at the at the prime, but also the prime and the subcontractors when you're trying to remove waste and have a more lean process. So it's 159 and we made it. <laughs> How is that for time boxing? Yes, 159 Eastern anyway. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. 